<laughs> All right. Uh, first off, I, some folks have been wondering. Um, your midterms are all graded, and the Web of Trust assignment is being graded right now. I'm actually downloading all of your keys on my machine so I can uh, grade that. And then later today, we will send you an email of the current status of where you are in the class. So any questions on that? Anybody? I haven't gone through to see who was the best uh, at social engineer in the Web of Trust assignment. Does anybody want to reveal their secret methods? Because <laughs> it always used to freak out. Password. Password. What was that? The adversary key. Did you change it? Is the password just password? Yeah. So, what did you change? The name. Your, you changed the name of your adversary key? Did that get anybody to sign it? I never submitted it. And there we go. <laughs> so it didn't help. Did anybody else try changing the name? No. Yeah, a bunch. What happened? Oh, it got rid of the signature. Yeah. It, got, it gets rid of the signature. It gets rid of the CSC 365 signature. Did anybody else figure out a way around that? Yeah, in the back. Add a UUID and then sign it with a bunch of BS signatures <laughs> that, you, that you make. Mm -hmm. And then the second uh, adversary UUID. ID shows up lower in there, and so when people are quickly doing it, they'll miss that there's a second signature and they'll just see the legitimate one at the top and think that everything in the middle is just people that they don't have the key for. So you made a bunch of fake keys, signed your adversary key, did it work? Yeah. Do you know how much? More than one. <laughs> More than one, I like it. Okay, cool. I know that. Uh, so what I did with that, because I got rid of the signature, was I created a fake CSC365 signature, and when I exported it, I exported the fake one into their key ring, so it shows. And then they would send me the real key, and then I would sign it with my real key, and then import my real key into their key ring after it was done. I see, so then did anybody, so anybody able, how would you detect that? So does anybody understand what happened there? Yeah. You could check the, you could uh, check the fingerprint of the CSC key uh, because that fingerprint could be different than the official one. Right, exactly. So this is why the fingerprint is so incredibly important, right? Why? What is the fingerprint? Did anybody dig into it? What does the fingerprint actually mean? Is it like a hash based on the key? Yeah, it's a hash of the key, right? So it's fundamentally unchangeable. It's a, so it uniquely identifies that specific key. So as you know, you created a key, right? You could create a key that has the same name, same email address, same everything as the CSE 365, but what can't you do? Yeah, you can't, you can't create something with the same fingerprint and you can't sign something as the original key, so, but you could. Uh, so, okay, so this is a, a good technique. Okay, so, oh, why is this not working? So you had your adversary key. It's uh, some name that's a random name. It's signed by the CSE 365 key. But then when you change this name to your name, this thing goes away, right? So then what did people do? They put their real name, and then they created a fake CSE 365 key, but so if you just sent this public key to somebody to sign, what does it look like on their end? It'll say user ID not found because they don't have it. It'll say user ID not found because they don't have this fake CSE 365 key, right? All of you should have the original one because you've downloaded it into your key ring and so you have it locally. So what do you do to deal with that fact? Or what did, did people do to deal with that? I have read through some readme, so I know people do this stuff. <laughs> import it into their key ring. What was that? You import it into their key ring. How do you import it into their key ring? You don't have control over their key ring. Yeah. Yeah, but you get, so when you export into a DPG like a file, you can export multiple keys. So you yep. export your key and the fake DPG key so that when they import it, they import both keys. Yeah, so this is again, so basically what you do, 
when you do, uh, when you're going to export your adversarial key, you append the adversarial key with your fake CSE 365 key. That way when they import it, they're importing two keys, your key, and it will show up as you know CSE 365. So if people aren't vigilant by checking that uh, fingerprint, they'll say that, hey, this is a, uh, this is the same. It has the same name as the one I'm expecting. So that's all good. Anybody go any other routes? Nobody wants to talk about it? It's like a code of silence. <laughs> successfully signed adversarial keys, right? In terms of extra credit and negative points. So uh, so no, I was in the middle of importing them. I had to resurrect some old code to download it and grade it. But yeah, that should take me not too long after class. Any other thoughts on defending? Anybody come up with any other interesting defensive techniques? Yeah. Just don't sign it. Say it again? <laughs> don't sign it. <laughs> I guess the best defense is not to play. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I noticed when you try to edit your adversary key, uh -huh. it says that it, it's suited to like S D A and something else. Well all of ours, if we follow the timeline, it's only S D A. So that was something that I was worried to receive. Nice. Okay, yeah, that has to do with you can create keys for signing, which are different than your encryption keys. So you can like keep those separate. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So trying to, how many adversarial keys did you have to look at? Did you just look at yours to figure that out or? I looked at mine and then I asked other people if they noticed that they also had the same set of Thanks. Cool, so trying to detect patterns between the adversary keys and the normal keys. Yeah. So I also started asking people for their adversarial keys. So I could, I could see if other people. Yeah, I don't know. It built the. I guess it helped build like the web of trust. Right. Okay. Cool. Interesting. How do you know they gave you real adversarial keys, not fake adversarial? Keys? Well, if it had the, if it had the same fingerprint as the class. So. Nice. Anybody use key servers? I was kind of surprised you guys didn't discover the key servers. No. Anybody know? 
know what I'm talking about at all? So there's like GPG run um, key servers that store people's keys. So you could upload, so rather than, so how did you then sign each other's keys? Email. Email, Email the most secure of mediums. <laughs> how did you? Discord. Discord, so <laughs> chatting. Google Drive. Yeah. Google Drive, nice. So how did that work? Um, it worked well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mechanically, how did it work? And then oh, um, so we had basically an alliance of everyone, and we were like, all right, we're not going to screw each other over. And that was enforced by we know where everyone will be two days a week, and 19v1 is pretty favorable. Um, and then everyone on the drive just made like a separate folder for themselves, uploaded their key, and then you just went through and downloaded, signed, and re-uploaded. So mechanically tedious, but effective. So you created kind of your own little key repository in some sense, of a trusted uh, key repository. Do you know if anybody broke in? Uh, not so no, not so Anyone all. want to admit that they broke into that? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how the grades reflect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's always an interesting thing, when you see an adversarial key on your thing, and uh, you don't quite know where that came from. The, so yeah, this is interesting. Okay, so especially to contrast the class that I did last year with this class, um, they had they found the key servers. So there are key servers where you can just upload, and it's built into GPG to upload your key to this key server, and that way other people can download your key based on a hash and sign it and re-upload the signed thing to the key server where you can just pull down the latest version. And then so people wrote helper scripts uh, to do this that would. Um, they weren't malicious in the sense that it would do something really bad, but it would check that the key was legitimate, but hard coding a backdoor like fake CSE 365 key that they would say that it was good. Um, we had people, oh, so another group tried to do a certificate authority kind of a thing where they had two people in charge of this where they would check, both of the, the two people would check the person's ID before getting them on the list. And then they had a Google doc where it had like trusted names on there and one person in the class who I think got 40 signatures on his adversarial key, um, he got onto the list just like by social engineering his way on, put his fake name on there and had everyone on that certificate authority sign his fake key in addition to other people. So um, yeah, anyways, I like hearing stories about how it went. Uh, what do you think about GPG in general? I know that was the question on the I kind of realized maybe I should ask that question after you understand your grades and see how many times you were scammed. <laughs> yeah. But what did you think about it before that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a bit of a learning curve. A bit? Yeah. I feel like that's putting it mildly, but yes. <laughs> Why is there a bit of a learning curve? Yeah. Well, uh, it's pretty hard to actually verify someone's identity. Why? Because they can just say they're whoever. I I'm Bob Dylan or whatever. Yeah, so so you have to try to link it back to some kind of physical, there's all that good stuff on the mailing list of, or on the piazza of like people posting pictures of their ASU ID and then somebody else posting that you shouldn't trust that because it's easy to Photoshop and then posted a Photoshop picture of a uh, ASU ID. Um, yeah, so you have like interesting facts and counter narratives that go on in the class of like how people can try to defend themselves. Um, maybe there are people with adversarial 4086 keys, I don't know. Maybe I randomly chose some or something. Um, I don't know if that's true, but anyways, any other thoughts on the, the matter? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that um, I could tell if it's an adversarial key if uh, the name doesn't uh, match the parts of the email that identifies the key. Mm -hmm. Like some emails contain uh, the initials of a name, or the first name, last name. Right. But some people had like Gmail addresses as their, because there's no limit on what the email actually was. It wasn't like you were checking that it was your, uh, your ASU ID. Yeah. Anyways, all right. Do you think it was fun? Was it fun? Yeah. Okay. Some people said they liked having to being forced to talk to people in their class. We've been taking classes together for like three years now, so I thought that was an interesting comment. Um, cool. All right. That was fun.
Now we are going to go on to our next topic. So we are going to look at network security. Um, and I think I already know the answer. Oh, but before we do, a lot of people here today. On Thursday, we have a invited guest lecture by Andy Kirkland, who is a uh, in charge of security for Starbucks, the Starbucks Corporation, including all the stores um, in the United States. He's a super interesting person, has a lot of good experience. He's going to talk about how he got to where he is, what um, what kind of like real world security is like, and then we're going to have a lot of time for a question and answer at the end. So that'll be on Thursday. Please come. I would not like him to come all the way here and speak to an empty room because uh, he came all the way from Seattle. I'm sure he'll be here. Uh, it will likely not be recorded because of Starbucks internal, um, well, lawyers basically. Um, policy? Yeah, their policy, their internal policy, and the lawyers basically do not want the talk recorded and posted online. So um, you can only get it in person on Thursday. Any questions? Cool. All right, so network security. So we've talked about a lot of kind of high level concepts when it comes to security so far. Uh, what kind of things have we talked about? Nobody remembers. The midterm's over, your brain's all white. Yeah. <laughs> Fresh new people. Yeah. Like protecting uh, company secrets. Okay, pr protecting secrets using what? Some sort of policy. Policies, what else? Cryptography. Cryptography, what else? What other stuff? Yeah. Access control mechanisms. Access control mechanisms, authentication. We talked about policies and mechanisms. So now we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive. Um, has anyone, I assume you all have not taken a networking course. Has anybody taken a networking course? But you have taken networking, some of you. OK, cool. Um, because we are going to, when, whenever I think about security and I think about um, especially computer security, so why do we care about the security of our networks? Yeah. It's typically, you have multiple systems able to be compromised on a network. Yeah, so now, so if you just have one machine that's not connected to any other machine, what do you have to worry about? Are you going to say something? Okay. So if you have one machine that's not connected to any other machines, what do you have to worry about in terms of security? Yeah. Physical access to that machine. Physical access to that machine. So why physical access? There's really no other way to get around the air gap. Well, I mean, there may be one. Very few ways, but yes, you would be very concerned with physical access to that machine. You may have different user accounts on that machine. They may have different privileges. You may have different passwords. But fundamentally, somebody has to be physically there at the machine to use it, right? Um, now, how does that contrast with the machine that is accessible by anyone on the internet? Yeah, it is accessible by everyone on the internet. And how does that change the security of the system? It's, or the way we think about it? It's subject to more different types of attacks, and they can be of different varying efforts. Yeah, so now, so let's think about what we talked about with authentication of passwords, right? So we have user accounts on this system. Do we have to be really worried about people guessing other people's passwords if they have to physically come and use the computer or the system? We can to a degree. What was that? We can to a degree because if a certain person has a certain password they always use, that's going to be where it's down on the keyboard. So you can just do sort of calculate, hey, these are keys are probably in these combinations and stuff on YouTube. Yeah, so we can think about maybe like, Okay, we don't want something in the sense of somebody sitting there guessing admin, admin, right, on the system to be able to easily elevate to admin privileges. But at the same time, you think, well, the person is standing there and they're just logging in. How many passwords could they guess per second? Ten. Not a lot. I don't even know. Ten, I guess. I feel like that's a high bar, but I don't know. I guess it depends on the system. And what password you're guessing and how fast you type. 
Um, but now if you're exposing the system to the internet where anyone could potentially log in from anywhere, now you have to worry about people remotely guessing passwords. You have to deal with any user facing um, software that has security vulnerabilities that could potentially get a foothold on the system. Uh, you need to think about a lot of different types of things. So what we're going to do here, we're not going to do a super deep dive, but we are going to get pretty technical in terms of how modern computer networks work such that we can talk about and discuss attacks against them and understand those attacks that are possible. Um, so this is important to kind of get not just the high level stuff we were talking about, but actually looking at it in concrete situations of how these things happen. Um, <coughs> and so actually I want to step back for a second and think about, so we, we talked about that yes, we do have these networks, but why are they important? What does networking, a computer networking allow us to do? Yeah, you just named like five different mind-blowing technologies if you were like living in the 60s, right? I'm so you're blown, it now. you're blown, blown away by it now. Yeah, so I'm actually blown away that it all works. Uh, or kind of works. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so <clears throat> once you have, so if you think about it at kind of the base level, a network computer is all about, networking is all about how do I send data from one machine to another? How do they talk to each other? Um, and this enables, and you're basically, I mean, essentially living in the age of networked computers, right? You have access to websites, um, you can SSH, you can pay for, what is it, like four cents an hour, you can get a three gig server on Amazon's EC2 and get remote access to it. Um, and then from that machine, I mean, you can basically get access to all the machines around the world. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff, and it's all based on a series of networking protocols called the IP, or the Internet Protocol Suite. And the basic idea and the way to think about these things are, and this is really what I believe, essentially what a computer science education is, is it should not be magic to any of you as to how data gets from one machine to another. In fact, when you graduate, there should be no magic left. Sorry if that, if you're hoping there would be magic in computers, there's nothing magic. They're all made by humans. They're all protocols that we can understand and study. You learn about, you take 340 and you learn about how a compiler translates your source code down to binary code. You take, I don't even know what the class is, but um, architecture class, so you can understand how a CPU actually executes those binary instructions. Um, you take a networking class to learn about how computers talk to each other. All of this is all just protocols. It's nothing, um, there's no magic anywhere. And so really, at the basic level, the IP suite is just a series of protocols to solve practical problems of how we transmit bits of data from one machine to the next. And it's based on, I mean, the other name for it is TCP IP protocol suite. Um, it's based on the concepts of abstraction and encapsulation. So what does abstraction mean? Simplifying the model so that it's easy to understand. Yeah, sim maybe simple, one way to think about it would be simplifying a model so it's easier to understand. What do you think? Anything else? Any other <coughs> abstraction thoughts? I also think of it as like hiding details. So. Um, which is essentially the same thing as um, building a more kind of abstract model, but uh, hiding details. So we'll look at all these different layers. There is, I always like to think about this. You have my machine right here, which is connected to a router. Does anybody see what the router is in this room? Usually, it's under the desk. It's under the desk. I don't know. I can't tell. Anyways. There's some router around here that my computer's connected to, all of your computers are connected to. So we know if we're talking on the internet, there is some way for the bits to go from the Wi-Fi chip that's in my computer to the Wi-Fi router. And then 
the data has to be able to propagate and go from there. And so uh, we'll talk about that. But um, basically, the way to think about TCPIP, if you've taken a networking course, they make a very big deal about the five or seven layers of the OSI model and blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm not a big fan of thinking of it in those terms, um, just because it's more important to understand what the layers do. There's blurring between layers. It's never s so nice that this layer just does this one thing. Um, but at the basic layer, we have this physical problem, which is kind of a physics problem in some sense, of how do you transmit information from one point to the next? So this is the physical layer. So when you're on Wi-Fi, this is the 802.11 spec of whatever A, N, G, B. I actually don't even know what numbers or letters we're on now. Um, but that governs, what was it, AC? Is that the latest one? Too many numbers, or letters, uh, even. So the whole idea is, and the same thing with Ethernet. Has everyone used Ethernet? I feel like I may. OK, thank gosh. <laughs> I was going to get really worried. Um, so Ethernet, right? How do we transmit bits on a wire, this coaxial, this Ethernet cable? Uh, you also have, what are other types of physical layers that you've heard about? Yeah. Fiber optics. What's fiber optics? You it's, like a little, it's a little light that like sends light down, like, down a wire. Yeah, it's crazy. It's literally like a wire like this and they bounce light off of it and they're able to transmit information very quickly um, using a fiber optic cable. What else? Dial up. Dial up? Ooh. <laughs> anybody, use, anybody use dial up or have used it? Oh, wow. OK. That's uh, when, where? <laughs> uh, visiting grandparents? Yeah. <laughs> nice. No, uh, you used to get the AOL TVs. AOL, yes. I, I definitely. So, so you think about it. What's, so a modem is transmitting data across a phone line, right? which is different than how you transmit data wirelessly and through Ethernet cables and through fiber optic cables. What are some other ones? Yeah. Uh, coaxial cable. Coaxial cable, right? So you, even if you're using networking in your house, right, you get a box from the cable company, usually if you have cable, that's a modem, and it has to translate the information that you're sending over the coaxial cable. Actually, I have no idea how that works. Um, well, I would say it uses different, like, uh, like the frequency, the mm. cable and the coaxial cable, your modem can actually like, use different frequency bands. To awesome. Transmit. Cool, yeah. Power line adapters. Power line adapters, yeah. Uh, anybody actually use these? Some people? No? Nobody? Uh, these are actually routers that you can get that plug into the, the power plugs and use your home's power network for networking. So you can set up a, like, essentially a switch on one end and connect outlets that you can plug your computers into. Uh, this is usually if your Wi-Fi is too slow. Uh, people used to use this. I don't know if it's still used anymore. What else? Anything else? Hotspot. A hotspot? Yeah, connecting your phone. I, which access modem is your computer? Yeah, so you have your phone, which which does either LTE or 4G or 3G or whatever, um, to a cell tower. But it's also capable of making data transmissions. Anybody heard of microwave? So they can use microwaves to transmit information. I believe the problem there is you need to have direct line of sight between the different um, endpoints. And I think I want to say the thing I remember is that it was used uh, to try to shave off time in uh, like trading, in like financial trading in the stock markets uh, because they can transmit information faster over microwave links than they could over the um, Coaxial or fiber, yeah. Like Pactor or Winmore. What was that? Pactor or Winmore, is there a packet radio? Oh, packet radio, okay, interesting. What does that use? Mostly in like amateur radio. I see what you're talking about. Yeah, nice. You can use high frequency radio waves too. That gives you beyond the like, so you can like, bounce it around. Yeah, so you can do all kinds of uh, crazy stuff. And so the question is, should your computer, if you want to talk to google.com, should you care what medium the data is being translated over? Ideally, no. Think about if you had to deal with that, right? About 
every operating system has to deal with and think about all these possible ways that data can be transmitted. And so this is why we get the nice thing about this layering. This physical layer only needs to worry about how do I get data from this point to this other point, and then I don't care what that data is that I'm transmitting, I don't care if it's a request to Google or if it's a ping. Oh, we didn't talk about satellites, so satellites too uh, are another aspect. So then above that we have a link layer, which is kind of a common abstraction layer on top of the physical layer that is a way to essentially in some sense give us addresses to say, okay, I know I'm this machine with this address A and the router has address B. I can use this physical layer to actually transmit information, but I want um, some properties here and we'll talk about that in a second, yeah. Is that, our, is that address resolution protocol? Yes, we'll talk about that in a second. So then above that, and so if you think about it, the way I think about it is the link is kind of, you can think of it as your first hop in the network. So how do you get data from one node to the next? The IP layer on top of that says, well, how do I get data between hops? Or how do I talk to different machines? So how do you send a letter? Has anybody sent a letter? How do you do it? Have you ever thought about it before? Give it to the postman. Yeah, okay, you just give them a uh, letter and they just take it from you? To an to okay. return address. So you need to do what? So what do you, so you have your letter, which is the, the data or the information that you want to send. What do you have to do with it? You can't just give, if you, you tried just giving a piece of paper that's printed as a letter out to a post person? You have to put an address in postage. So you have to put an address, which is what? Destination. Yeah, the destination of where this data should go. You need to put postage to pay for it. What else do you need? Return address. Yeah. You're supposed to put like your own address, so if it doesn't get to them, then you can get it back, or somebody knows how to send it back to you. Exactly, okay, for two purposes, right? You need a return address that shows in case something happens, let's say the destination doesn't actually exist, they can, the post office can send it back to you, but also, so once the person receives that message, they know how to actually send a piece of, of mail back to you. Do you have something else? Right, so if you think about it, so this is basically a network of postal addresses that we can send data. It is very slow comparatively, although I guess it depends on it does depend on what you're sending. If you're sending some people eight terabyte hard drives, you can get pretty good uh, uh, throughput th that way. But the important point to think about there is you need those same kind of concepts in a computer network as well. You need some way to talk about what is the destination? Where should this data be going? What's your address? Where should return messages go to you? So there's, that's what the uh, internet or the IP, the internet protocol layer is. So every node on the internet has an IP address that is accessible and this is essentially the equivalent to an address in the physical kind of mailing system. Um, we'll see, but basically an IP address defines in some sense like one machine or one computer. Right, so we basically have all the layers here, and we haven't talked about how they work at all. That's what we're going to kind of dig into um, as we continue on this topic. But we have all the information here for how to get some data from one machine to the other. The question is, in some sense, who is that data for? So why are we doing networking? Why are we making these awesomely complicated networks? To send and receive data. To send and receive data for what? To people? To different computers. To different computers, just like a computer itself? Who's going to respond to that data? The applications that are on the computer. Yeah, so we need some application, right? We need, there needs to be some program, you can think of it, running on that remote system that is expecting messages from us and can respond to them appropriately. 
right? It'd be like sending a message to uh, a house where nobody lives, right? You're never going to get a reply back from that. So now, can you run more than one program on a computer? That wasn't a resounding yes. <laughs> it wasn't a trick question. Yes, right? This is the magic of, um, I don't want to say multi-threaded. What's the word I'm looking for? Something about computer architecture. Parallelism, concurrency? Yeah, let's go with that. It's not right, but uh, it works for <laughs> Not that it's wrong. It's not the word I was looking for is what I meant. Um, Multi-user operating systems, maybe? I don't know. Anyways, uh, it doesn't matter. So, so we need some way. So I think of this like an IP address is the equivalent of a building address. So anybody live at a build in an apartment complex? Yep. When you send, when you get letters, do you just get letters to the building? No. No? Why not? Because you don't live in the building. You live in a specific place. You live in a specific unit inside that building. So they need some way to differentiate all the people that live at that same address so that they can route the mail appropriately. So that's essentially what you can think of as the next layer provides along with some other stuff, uh, which we'll get into, is the transport layer defines this notion and will, um, the, way, the terminology here, so you have an IP address defines the address of a machine, and then the port number, which is defined here, basically defines where should this data go which is why, and you need some kind of standardization here, because if I say, wow, I really want to make an HTTP request to this machine, what port should I talk on? 80, because it's a standard port for, port eight, uh, for the HTTP protocol. So there's a whole standardization body that's kind of standardized all these different protocols, because uh, the other way to, to always think about it is, Usually you have basically clients and server applications, right? So you have some server that's willing to accept requests from some clients. Uh, it needs to know what port to run on, and all the clients need to know where to find it. Um, so on top of this, and really when you boil it down, I mean, this is kind of, so if you're able to, and the physical layer, actually, to be honest, I don't really care about, because this is more like a, in my mind, more of a hardware thing of how things actually happen. But these layers, the link, the internet, the transport layer, understanding all these layers, you will understand exactly how data is transmitted between nodes on the internet, uh, which is a very powerful skill. Um, the application layers, these are applications that use basically these, this whole stack. So the nice thing is because of this abstraction, like I mentioned, if you're writing, let's say an HTTP server or an HTTP client, you don't have to care in some sense about all of these layers of what is this machine connected to? Is it talking over a satellite link or a microwave link? Um, you can just write with certain abstractions. Um, so everybody should most of you aware of HTTP, the web protocol, hypertext transport protocol, SMTP? Yeah, mail. So this is uh, sending email, basically, SMTP, uh, DNS. Yeah, domain name system, so it translates uh, domain names to IP addresses, which we'll talk about in a bit. And NFS. Network file system. Yeah, network file system, so this is basically uh, sharing files on a, usually a local network is how you want to do that. Um, any questions on the high level design here? Yeah. What's a link again? So link is, we'll, we'll get into it, it basically, when you, the way I think of it is MAC addresses, basically. So physical uh, addresses, which are needed for machines to talk to each other on at the link level. Um, and then, so in this way, you can basically talk to machines local to you, more or less. Uh, you need the other layers to kind of go more broadly, but I think that's probably a bad way to describe that, but it'll become much more clear when we look at examples of how, how these kind of all work in concert. Um, another important thing of why 
at least studying networking is important. Has uh, anyone interviewed for internships or jobs? Yep. Do they ask you anything about networking? Mm. What do they ask? Yeah. They ask like the question asked about like how to be in a network. So like if they want you to explain parts of that particular. Yeah. So there's I've heard that. Any other ones? Yeah. Nice. Okay. So, how DNS works? Yeah. How would you implement Monopoly over HTTP? Oh, nice. How would you implement Monopoly and get sued for copyright infringement? <laughs> yeah. The other, the question I think that I like the most is basically in your browser. Let's say you type Google.com into the uh, into the search bar. You hit enter and then name everything that happens from that point on. And I think there's really good tutorial, because you can go crazy. I mean, you can go to the application, to the syscall, and there's Chrome's doing some caching, and <laughs> finally then to, you have to do what we just talked about, a DNS to resolve the IP address, and then you need to start a TCP connection with that machine, which you need to use all of these levels. Like, you can get crazy in depth in that. Um, there's a good, I, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but there's a good blog post that was floating around that kind of walked through, even at a high level, of what happens after that. But anyways, it's one of the interview questions I've heard that I've thought is the best. Um, <coughs> and it's not, uh, the important thing to remember is that it's not like a, just a memory or memorization thing. Because I've seen this before where people just like can memorize like cons, like definitions of things, but not how these systems actually work together. And how they work is the most important part here. Um, like how a TCP connection is started is a very important point. How these things like ARP actually impacts and works into here, not just what the definition is. Cool. OK, so we will start. We're going to kind of. It may seem a little bit backwards. It may seem like we have this beautiful hierarchy. You just kind of study up, and then everything will make sense. We're going to kind of go all over the place. We're basically going to take it, I think of as a hop at a time. So we're going to look at basically how a machine or how machines on a network can communicate with each other without going to any external networks. And then we'll broaden out from there. Um, it's actually a fairly I wouldn't say simple procedure, but if you're able to get the one hop concept, multiple hops are not crazy. Any questions before we continue? Yeah? Can you define a hop in that context? Uh, data from one machine to another, we'll say, right now. So, yeah. So I think about, I like Ethernet because to me it makes more physical sense. Um, so their local, a one hop connection would be basically, so you have multiple machines, let's say you have three machines connected to a switch over ethernet, it'd be one machine talking to another machine on that network. Uh, and then going out of that would be how does that, let's say you now have a router that can go to the internet, how does the information get from you to Google and back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think not just like an individual system. But don't individual systems also have IP addresses? Like, can't you have like IP addresses like within like the, I don't know, it's like more nested, right? So it. I'm sort of like <coughs> curious how that works. It, it definitely can be. Let's see, what's the best way to describe this? Um, yeah, I mean, this is the problem when you don't have physics involved, things can get more complicated, right? So I think it's still, so. The way I think of it is the IP address corresponds in a broad sense to one machine. And that machine can have multiple applications running in it. Uh, where this gets complicated is when you have, well, you have something like Google, right? So Google.com is a, well, there are a series of IP addresses that correspond to Google.com. And their domain names will give you different IP addresses that are geolocated close to your area. So you don't have to travel far for them. Uh, but you go to them, and then once your request goes in, Google can get basically any number of systems to actually respond to that request. So it, it's all, again, kind of a matter of abstract abstraction. On the abstract level, you don't care 
And this is kind of the beauty. You don't care what Google does as long as you can talk to a specific IP address on a specific port, make an HTTP GET request, and they will send you an HTTP response. As long as that happens, you don't care. And that's the other beauty of the internet. When we talk about all these different protocols, you don't care if your data went over ethernet or coaxial or fiber optics or up to a satellite and back, uh, carrier pigeon, whatever. Like As long as you get a reply that's appropriate, it, everything works. Um, so yeah, and then it gets even more complicated if you're running virtual machines and you private networks and all this stuff. So uh, yes, it can get as complicated as you want. But it all boils down to these principles, so it's not anything crazy. So nobody, I, I think a lot of students get, there's a lot of things going on here, um, and they kind of over, overestimate, I think, the complexity here and get kind of put off by this networking stuff. But uh, just take it step by step and put yourself, I mean, you're a computer scientist, you're learning kind of, in some sense, how to think like a computer. So you just think, like, okay, how does this thing work? It sees this piece of information. What does it do with it? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then go from there. Cool. Okay. So IP addresses. So, and this is where we're already getting slightly more complicated, but that's okay. Uh, each host, so do you need an IP address to talk to machines on the network or on the internet? Yes, otherwise you can't communicate. You need some way to talk about each other, right? So you need at least one IP address in some sense, uh, especially if you want other people on the network to be able to talk to you, right? And which is essentially a server. How can I talk to you if I don't know what address to use? If you can't just say throw a bottle in the air or into the ocean and I'll definitely get it at some point, right? That is not a uh, successful networking strategy. So each machine needs to have at least one, it could have more IP addresses. That's actually not that important. Yeah. Well, I have a question about that. Sure. Uh, if you can't throw a bottle in the air, like, you know, how does listening work? Listening would, is basically the equivalent of you renting an apartment in a specific port at a specific building. So, does that mean that radios have addresses too? Wait, say that again. So this is, I guess, in the specific context of computer networking, in that you want to send messages from one place to another. So yeah, you can't just, well, there are broadcast type things, but they're in local networks. You can't send a message to everyone on the internet. That's, uh, you can try, though. I mean, and actually there are tools, uh, there's a tool called ZMAP that you can play with that can scan the IPv6 address space to the 32 addresses. Uh, and I think it's like 15 minutes or 30 minutes. It's very, very fast. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, good questions. So the whole idea, and when, when we need to think about these things, we need to think, OK, it has some address. But do our computers good with like, I don't know, do we want postal codes and cities and states? Like when you have a physical piece of mail, you, you specify the address by what? City, state, zip, is that it? And then just street. Street, house number, right? I heard you used to be able to, in like a small town, you could like describe the house and the mail would get there because the post person would know which house it was. Like the house with the tree and the red door and it would, they'd be able to figure it out. But I think nowadays that's highly unlikely to happen. Um, so we need some kind of address, but are computers good with those kinds of things? What do computers deal with? Bits. Yeah, it's kind of a trick question, but binaries, right? Ones and zeros, but we abstract that into numbers, right? Computers care about numbers. So essentially what we're going to do is represent addresses as numbers. And we'll use 32 bits. So this means we have how many? IPv4 addresses. Yeah. What? We have 32 bits to represent an IPv4 address. 256? 2 to the 32, which is how much? 4 billion. Yeah, four, roughly 4 billion. Is that enough? Not anymore. 
more. Oh, that's not what I want. Don't do that. Yeah, so we have 2 to the 32, which you can do some kind of calculation. Is it like 4.7 billion or something? 4.3-ish. Uh, 4.3-ish? That's good enough. What's well, a half a billion? Uh, so there's 4.3 billion addresses. Now, the, this seems like it would be definitely enough addresses. The problem comes up in that what's the relation between two different numbers in an I like, so it is actually more of a conceptual question. That's what I always like to think about when I'm studying these protocols and everything is like, why did they design it this way, right? So let's say I have the IP address, right? It's just a number. Let's say I have the IP address one and the IP address two. Should they be related to each other? Yeah. It's supposed to be like close to each other in space. Maybe. Or think about this as an organization. You're a company. How do you want your IP addresses? So I guess one question to think about is who gives out IP addresses? Your company, do you want, let's say addresses 20 through 50? Or do you want like 20, uh, 10, 14, all the way up to like 30 different non-contiguous numbers? Yeah, it'd be nice to have like a block, yeah. It'd be kind of nice to have a block. And so they came up with this concept of, so the first idea is rather than do the numbers as just a 32-bit integer, which you actually can do if you've ever wondered, uh, you can turn, so most IP addresses you've seen are probably in this dotted decimal notation. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. But you can easily convert these numbers to, um, uh, two decimal. So how do we interpret this number? <coughs> what was it? Yeah, so how many bits in each? Eight. Yeah, so we have eight bits, eight bits, eight bits, eight bits. Uh, so we have two that, so this combination here represents, so if you take, we have our 32-bit number, You separate it up into eight chunks. You turn each of them into decimal. You have your um, your dotted decimal notation, and you can represent every number from zero. Well, here it would be zero dot zero dot zero dot zero. What's the largest number going to be? Two five five two five five two five five two five five two five five. Yeah. And so once they had this, then they had this idea of. Basically, why don't we separate out sets of addresses into different classes? So that looks terrible, so we will not go with that. But, <coughs> so initially they had this idea to separate up, and basically separate all the networks up and split that 32-bit integer, which was the IP address, into different boundaries where some boundaries were the net ID. So basically the way to read this is you have a 32-bit number. Um, so seven bits uh, would define the network. And this leftover, what's this? So 24 bits for the uh, hosts. And so this, you'd have two to the 24 hosts in one organization. Um, class B addresses had 16 bits. So these were, um, oh, actually it's right here. Right. What's this? So 16 million hosts, 65,000 hosts, or 256 hosts. So you can think of these as predefined ranges that you could get from a central authority that would say, okay, great, here's your number. Which of these would you like to have? A. A, why? Most hosts. Yeah, you could get an IP address for all your hosts, like every machine in your network. Um, 
But if you start giving this out, are you going to use all 16 million posts? Yeah. <laughs> so think about ASU. Think about ASU, right? Which of these cutoffs, you can have 256 hosts, 65,000 hosts, or 16 million hosts. Is that right? Yeah. Which one fits ASU? B. B? How many students do we have? Yeah, 90,000. That's not even enough for IP address for every student, not to mention staff, machines, servers, all that. Students of other years. So what? Students of other years. And, well, maybe even students of other years. Yeah, thinking about that. So we need a class A, but do we need 16 million of those? No, that, I don't even think we could fill that for a long time, right? So they, this is kind of more of a historical perspective where they had these fixed class sizes. And so what's the, so what's the key problem here? There's no in between. There's no in between. There's no way to say, well, I don't need 16 million, but I definitely need more than 65,000. And so this actually led to a lot of uh, unused IP address, IPv6 space, which is why even though we have 4.7 million theoretic IPv6 addresses, we've actually, I think, run out of IP, like free IPv6 addresses on the internet. Um, or sorry, V6, V4, 32-bit uh, addresses. Um, <laughs> so they had to come up with a new way of thinking about this idea of representing this split. And the key concept here is rather than splitting which was the network and which was the hosts on these fixed boundaries, you can essentially represent, you can say which bit. So the whole idea, uh, 10.0.0.0 slash, um, so you can put it on the 24th bit, which would be here, which leaves how many bits for hosts? Eight, eight bits, so you have two to the eight, so you have, uh, what is this, 256? 256 hosts, or you could put it on zero, 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 slash, uh, we'll be in the middle. Uh, you could do slash 10, so you'd have, what is that, 23, two to the 23 bits, so you have a lot of flexibility in how to define these things. So um, as a little preview, IPv6, as I kept mentioning, has 128-bit addresses. So there are something outrageous, like enough IPv6 addresses for grains of sand on the earth or something <laughs> absurd. Um, the number is really, really, really big. Um, so we hopefully will not run out of those, but who knows? Maybe that's not enough for the galaxy. Um, <coughs> okay, so we can think of this defining what machines, and the way to think about this is what machines are on our local network versus not on our local network. So a common thing we've seen, so what are some common IP addresses you know of? Let's start there. Zero, zero. Oops, zero, dot zero. What else? Eight, 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 eight. Eight, 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 eight. Google's DNS service. One, 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 one. Cloudflare's one. What is it? Let's say you're ten. Ten, zero, zero, zero. Two seven zero zero one. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, numbers that are reserved or special. Uh, the 127, I think it may be a slash 8, but it may be a slash 16. Um, it's a slash 16? Yeah. So this is reserved for your local machine. So nobody will route packets to 127.0.0.1, or they shouldn't, because that exists, address does not exist on the internet. Other special addresses, this 10.0.0.0 slash 8, this whole network is a local uh, internal network. 
This means you'll never find a, a external IP address that's within this 10.0.0.0 range. So this is basically used for companies or organizations internally when they don't want or need their local network to be accessible externally. Yeah? Is CIDR an alternate notation for using a subnet mask? Yes. Okay. It's equivalent. Uh, these are not special addresses. 192168, I actually don't know the, it's a slash 16. This is a slash 24. What's the other one? There's another internal, is it 172? 116, yeah, I can't remember, that's like the. It's 172. So it's 172, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, anyways, there's an RFC that actually specifies these things. But anyways, the whole point is that Let's take 192.168.0.0 slash 16. So, so you can think of this as any other IP address where the first 16 bits matches this number is within that network and is one hop away. So going back to the hop thing we were talking about. Everything else is different and we don't know how to talk to it yet. So if I give you an IP address of like 192.168.10.10, .10, is that a local address or an external address? Local. How could you tell? First 16 uh, bits. Yeah, which in this are these two octets, right? These actually are bit operations, so if you had something weird like a 15, you would need to translate each octet to the bits and then match the bits up uh, to be able to tell appropriately. Uh, if we had a, an address that was 193.168.10.10, uh, what type of address is this? External. External. Cool. So. The way to think about it is every machine on the network needs to know a series of pieces of information. It needs to know its IP address, and it needs to know its network, which there's a number of ways to do that. I like this CIDR mask, because uh, to me it's really uh, simple, because you can actually combine both of them. So let's say your IP address is 192.168.0.10. And your network is a slash 16. So this means if you want to talk to a machine 192.168.1.1 and on your local network? Yes. Local. What if we change this now to a slash 24? Local address? No, no external. What does the slash represent? It's, uh, it's this form of CIDR notation. It's the subnet. Yeah, so, it's, so it subnet defines, apps. so this defines the split between the network bits and the host bits. It's called the subnet mask. Well, uh, we'll get to that. We haven't talked about that yet. Like I said, they're equivalent. Oh. So this is CIDR notation that you can easily figure that out. So it says, which of these bits do I use to say what? And the way I think about it is from the perspective of a machine on the network. I'm a machine. My IP address is 192.168.0.10. How do I figure out what other machines are on my network or not? And this slash 24 says, use the first 24 bits. And if those match any other address, then you're good and you can talk on the same local network. Any questions on this? Cool. Okay. <coughs> okay, so we need to. Whoop, hello. 
Uh, we need to start there because we need to talk about these concepts of machines. So we need to talk about addresses. We need to be able to determine if our communications are internal or external. So now we're going to go into a little bit more into how the IP layer actually does this. Um, and you can think of the IP protocol as being able to get data not just in a local network, but also between multiple uh, networks. And that really comes down to, so what's the, uh, so the way we've been talking about networks, right? So if we have our little local network, we have, uh, let's say a, a switch here, and we have some machines connected to it, and we'll say A, B, C, D. So this is our local network. Is this the internet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Four nodes on the internet. You're confident, fully confident, final answer. Yeah. What was that? Intranet. Yeah, it's just an internal network or a network, right? So this is an important concept of getting like. Um, I know it's not the style guide to capitalize I anymore, but I think that's dumb because there's only one internet. To me, it's a proper, a proper noun. So what's the difference between our internet and our intranet? Yeah. I mean, you have a gateway to access, hopefully, the external the internet. Yeah, so it's essentially, you can the way to kind of think of it is it's a series of networks that all share this, basically this IP space. Uh, I'm running out of letters. <laughs> right, so it, it kind of answers the question of how does A talk to G, which is in some completely other network. Right? And that's basically, IP kind of does all of that. So you're designing this in really important protocol. You don't know it at the time because this is like uh, mid 70s, late 70s, I think. Um, I need to get that picture. Um, so you're designing, it's, it's, it eventually will become the glue of the internet as we know it today. Multi, multiple billions of dollars businesses will rely on it. Every single person uh, will use the internet almost daily in their lives. What types of things would you want from a protocol that gets information from one point to another? The data is reliable. What was it? The data is reliable. So you'd want some way, so you'd want the data to be reliable in what sense? So the data can't be reliable, but what do you want about the, the data to be reliable? That the data that you sent is the same data that they received. What else do you want? Do you have something? Yeah. Oh. You want it to be fast. You want it to be fast? Yeah. It to be robust. Robust? In what sense? In like gray areas of, oh, what happens if this, if these two events happen? And should be able to yeah, so robust in the sense of what happens if the data gets lost? Which your letter, what happens if your letter gets lost? Yeah. Yeah, you may want to, so what's the difference between, at a fundamental level, a, an envelope and a uh, <coughs> postcard? Postcards do not write really, I guess. <coughs> right, a postcard, everybody seen a postcard? Understand the concept of a postcard? Piece of paper, you write the address, put the postage on one side, and on the other side you write the message. So which fundamentally means that once you hand it into the mailbox, anyone who sees that can easily read the data that's there. Whereas an envelope, they would have to open up the envelope in order to see what's inside. What else, what other types of things would you want? Yeah? Well, not that it's important to understand but I feel like I would want it to be compatible across devices. Mm, okay, so compatibility, so device compatibility. Yeah. That's a good one, yeah. Uh, stable and reliable. Stable, reliable. So reliable in what sense? So that if you send a message, what do you want to know? So think about it from that perspective. That they received it. That they received it, and then they received the same thing that you sent. IP does none of these things. 
very few of those things. Actually, none. So uh, it provides, so connectionless, which means you just shoot off some data. You don't establish any connection. It's unreliable in the sense that there's no, it gives you no guarantee that the message will ever be delivered, that the message will be exactly the same as the one you sent. If you send a met, this is one thing we didn't talk about. If you send a message A and then a message B, what order do those arrive in? Do they arrive A then B or B then A? The network makes no guarantees of that. Non-duplication, you may send one letter A, they may get five letters A. And bandwidth is not guaranteed. So there's actually no guarantee that there's even any bandwidth available for you to, for your message to get there or for their message to get back to you. There's no guarantee, which is actually very different than the way the phone network works. <coughs> where traditionally, essentially it's a circuit switch network where every switch guarantees you some bandwidth for your phone call. Um, and it can't be used by other people. Just shake your faith in the network. It should in some sense. So why don't they do that? Why don't they, because these are all things that you clearly want. You talked about wanting them. You just are looking at these problems. It's not like the people designing this were idiots. Too late now. It's too late now. Uh, no, but good. Uh, it is too late now. You cannot replace the IP layer. That's, I think, a, a good statement of fact. Yeah. Well, if the IP protocol is like the glue, don't you want it to be like basic and not like restricting in any sense? Yeah, so thinking about going back to our layers, right? We have the IP layer. Does every single application need to need all data to go in the same order and to be exactly the same? What are some, what about uh, email? Yes, do you want to send an email and have it come out garbled? No. What other, what applications? Yeah. Most streaming type stuff doesn't need stuff to be in order because if you didn't get it, it's already out of date by the time it were to be reset. Right, so out of order, dropped packets, right? If you're on a Skype call or a strict, like a voice call, you may not care if, if I mean, it's a real-time communication. You don't care if that packet, a tiny glitch gets dropped. What other cases of streaming, yeah? Uh, would BitTorrent count as well? Is it like getting certain pieces? Yeah, BitTorrent's a little bit trickier, though, because you want to make sure you get the same file at the end that you started with, and so you need to rely, I mean, you need to have something. But again, you could do that on top and not necessarily in the network itself. Um, yeah, streaming is actually the main the main way of, of thinking about this. So, um, and so, do you put these restrictions in the core part of the internet that restrict these types of applications that may not care about these properties that we just talked about? So, it actually is a a thoughtful design principle to say, hey. Um, and we'll actually see we get some of these in higher levels at the transport layer. Um, but it's crazy to think about this, that you don't get any of this, yeah. So was this a forward thought or an after thought in, in design? Because it was not for the input it, Some of the things, so there's two ways to think about it, right? Just think about it, what's the perspective back then? And then what could I change now if I had a magic wand? Uh, for me, I think the big thing I would try to change here is integrity. So kind of putting integrity into this layer because I think for basically every application when you're sending data, you wanna be dang sure that they actually received the data that you sent and it wasn't manipulated or changed along the way. Uh, but that's not very easy, it's not super easy and at the time, I mean they even have me uh, me mechanisms for that but it uses CRC32 which is not a cryptographically secure hash function basically. Um, so that would be nice. Uh, oh shoot, we're over time. Okay. Uh,
All right, we'll come back to this next Tuesday. Come on Thursday for the uh, for Andy's talk. <laughs>